Well, you know, I like to sort of begin with a funny story. So, actually, I got a couple. Because we need to laugh. I know I need to laugh. Because God is good. Because laughter is merry to the soul, is what my Bible says. Amen. So, a couple of church bulletin bloopers. One, don't let worry kill you off. Let the church help. <laughs> church bulletin blooper number two. Potluck supper Sunday at 5 p.m. Prayer and medication to follow. <laughs> And then I want to tell you a Joel Osteen story. You know, a man uh, called the church and said, Ma'am, I want to speak to the head hog. And the secretary responded, Sir, we do not have a head hog. Please show respect to our pastor by addressing him as senior pastor. And the man said, Ma'am, I just want to give $100,000 to the church. The secretary hesitated for a minute, and then she said, just a minute, Porky just walked in. <laughs> now you know this is not our pastors. It's just a funny story, okay? Praise God, well let's pray. Father, we need your word today. Our hearts are open. Our minds are receptive. And so, Father, speak your word, I pray, through me, Lord. Let every word be from the very mouth of our Lord and Savior. We thank you for it, Father. I submit my will to your will and we, as a congregation, both on house, in the house, and online, submit our will, our minds, and our soul to your word. Let it have its way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, i got to be a little open here and transparent. This sermon to prepare has been one of the most difficult for me. I know I don't prepare a lot of sermons, but from those that I have prepared, this has been very difficult for me. There's been a heaviness, but see, God is faithful. And there are going to be some people, as Pastor Charles said, set free today. <laughs> this is your day. Be open, be receptive. And so Pastor Charles has been teaching on this series, Alive, with our key foundational scripture, Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15. If you are, if you can, if you would stand and read it with me, please. And you were dead because of your sins, and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for the, he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Praise God. That's worth shouting about, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. And so the series Alive made alive together with him. We're going to talk some more about that today. You know, last Sunday, Pastor Charles' sermon really struck to my heart. 
and I believe the heart of God, of what the Spirit is saying we need. And so this will be, this will be Alive in the Spirit, part two for today. You know, Pastor Charles said that life in the Spirit is a game changer. And so it's so crucial that we understand the game-changing impact of the Holy Spirit on the lives as we walk out this Christian walk. We need to understand this so that we can effectively live this life for Christ, so that we can walk in the fullness of God and the fullness of our destiny that God has prepared before the foundation of the world for each and every one of us. You know, Paul prays that the Ephesians would be filled with all the fullness of God. And so I know that is the prayer of our pastors here at Bethel Temple Church for this local body and then for the worldwide body of Christ. You know, we're going to be celebrating Independence Day in a few days. And so I wanted to try to explore the analogy between America's Independence Day and the Christian Independence Day. You know, in America, Independence Day is a federal holiday commemorating the Declaration of Independence, which was ratified by the Second Continental Congress on July 4th, 1776. And it birthed a new country the United States of America, and declared our independence from Great Britain. But see, that wasn't the end of the story. When the Declaration of Independence was declared, Great Britain made their own declaration, and they declared war on the United States. And so this war was called the American Revolution. So there was a battle in order for this declaration to become a reality. And so I want to talk to you today about another independence, and that's the spiritual independence of each and every person. And that, it, and that independence allows us to put off the old man and to put on the new man in Christ. And so just like the United States made a Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776, and a new nation was born, the first step in spiritual independence is to make that Declaration of Independence. And for us, in our spiritual realm, that Declaration of Independence is our prayer of salvation. When we make that prayer of salvation, we are declaring our independence from the old nature and we are declaring a new birth. <laughs> you know, Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed to be born again. He needed a spiritual birth to see the kingdom of God. Look at me, look with me with John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You see, this born-again experience is probably, I believe, one of the greatest miracles of all. Think about it. You have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, 
coming to live inside of your heart at the prayer of salvation. What a man, how can that happen? Even as Nicodemus said, how can that be? But Jesus told him, stop marveling at it and believe it because God did it. So Jesus tells Nicodemus, you don't see the wind, but you do see the effects and you hear it. You see the leaves blowing. So too is this spiritual rebirth, this born again experience. This born to the spirit experience is truly a game changer. And I believe it is the greatest miracle that can ever happen to anyone. When the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside your heart. Lord, help us grasp and understand the ramifications so that truly we can see the effects of that. You know, Paul reiterates this idea that we are a new creation in Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If you have said and meant this prayer of salvation, you are now a new creation in Christ. You may not feel it. You may not, some people feel whatever and some people don't. It doesn't matter what you feel. The Word of God says that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside your heart when you uh, profess that prayer of salvation. And you're now a new creation in Christ. You have a new king on the throne of your heart now. And this is your declaration of independence from your old sin nature. Your old flesh nature is no longer on the throne of your heart. <laughs> but let's not forget, with this declaration of independence comes the battle for independence. <laughs> what happened when the United States was created and declared independence from Great Britain? Well, the King of Great Britain declared war on the United States. Well, the same thing happens when you declare your independence from the old fleshly nature with your prayer of salvation. You declare that you have a new allegiance to Jesus and that you are, and that you have a new king ruling in your heart. Well, that old fleshly nature declares war on this new creation and the war of independence begins in your own mind and in your heart. But just as the new United States had some allies to help to fight the battle for independence, God has given us an ally to fight this battle for our independence from that old fleshly nature. And that is the second empowerment of the Holy Spirit, what we call the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Look at me at Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then Jesus goes on to say a few verses later in verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I want to clarify something about this baptism in the Holy Spirit. It is separate from your spiritual birth at salvation. You know, on the day of Christ's resurrection, he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And we get that from John chapter 20, verses 22. And that was their spiritual birth. 
That's what happens when we declare our independence with our prayer of salvation. God breathes his Holy Spirit upon our very hearts. And he comes to live through his Holy Spirit in that, in our heart. But see, there is another experience with the Holy Spirit that's recorded in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. Jesus was telling the disciples to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And please take note that this declaration by Jesus was said after he had already breathed the Holy Spirit upon them, as we see in John 20, 22. So we have this second empowerment, what we Pentecostals call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Please take note. God wants you to get this. We sang about this. We talked about this in the worship. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appealed to them divided tongues as a fire. And one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And least we think that was only a one-time event. There are other scriptures in Acts that tell us about this. And I'm going to pick out one, Acts chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And so when they heard this, this was a group of disciples, when they heard this, uh, who, who had heard about John, but they had not heard about Jesus. And he says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Yeah. The infilling, the second empowerment of the, Holy, of the Holy Spirit is a basic principle and is an ally that God has given us so that we can fight with victory this declaration of independence that we've made with our salvation prayer. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is a crucial ally that God has given us to fight this battle. You know, baptism in the Holy Spirit, we said, was the second experience after salvation, where the believer is totally immersed or immersed in the Holy Spirit, so that, so that the Holy Spirit dominates and even overwhelms them. And then baptism in the, is evidenced by the speaking in tongues, speaking in a language that you did not learn from both, it could be a heavenly language, not spoken here on earth, or it could even be a language spoken by others on earth, but you did not learn. So baptize, baptism in the Holy Spirit is, 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 a, is an experience that God has given us because he knew we would need that empowerment to be his witness. And that power to witness. You know, you witness with your words, certainly. But you also witness by your lifestyle. In fact, people will probably listen more to your lifestyle than they will to the words that come out of your mouth. So all lifestyle needs to be a holy life that we've been called to live. And so baptism in the Holy Spirit gives us this additional power to battle for our independence from our old flesh nature. Because living the holy life is a witness for Christ 
to the world, to the dying world around us. You know, 1 Peter 1, 15, 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you remember Paul's complaint about the Corinthian church, was that some believers in the Corinthian congregation were speaking in tongues, but they didn't allow the Spirit to work internally in their lives. And so he had to chastise them in chapters 3, 2 and 3. See, our, li our lives need to demonstrate the spiritual fruit as well as the spiritual gifts. And these both issue from the supercharged power that's gained from the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this Pentecostal experience, which we proclaim in this congregation and every other Pentecostal church in the world. See, the Spirit living inside our heart with the additional power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit gives us the power to battle for our independence from the old sin nature. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verses 11 through 14. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And so I think the key to winning this battle over our fleshly nature is in Romans 8, 13. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. See, Paul explains how the power of the Holy Spirit in us can put to death the deeds of the old sin nature. So we do not have to follow after the desires of those old sin nature. You know, I don't know about you. Sometimes, well, if you talk with my wife, I'm sure she'll help explain. Sometimes that old sin nature rises up in me. But see, I have a choice now. I'm no longer under bondage to that old sin nature. I have the spirit of the living God living inside my heart. And that spirit of the Christ, the living God, rises up, says no. Deny it. Now, I must admit, sometimes it's like roots being pulled out of my very being. Have you ever worked in a garden or something and pulled out roots? And sometimes the soil surrounding the roots come out with it, with those roots. Well, sometimes that sin nature attitude feels like ripping portions of my heart out when I say, no, I will not, I will not. I declared my independence, and my independence makes me free. I do not have to listen. I do not have to follow. I do not have to follow. But see, we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. You know, sometimes we quench the Holy Spirit. 
we quench that Holy Spirit in our hearts. And let this be a warning. You continually to quench the Holy Spirit. Your old sin nature is going to try to put himself back on that throne. Please do not continue to quench that Holy Spirit. And why would you? Because the scripture says it only leads to death. <laughs> it only leads to death. Whereas you're le if you're led by the Spirit, you're the sons of God and you will live. I don't care what Satan tries to put in your mind that, well, I got I to gotta do that. I got to have that. I got to whatever. No, you don't got to. <laughs> You do not gotta. Lord, help us, right? Amen. Lord, help us. You know, Pastor Charles referred to James 4, 7 last Sunday. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. You don't gotta. I don't care what Satan tells you, you don't got to. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. That is from the very word of God. And so it may be, uh, temp it, it, whatever Satan tempts you to do, it's only temporary anyway. Because if you've got the Holy Spirit living inside you and you do not follow that Holy Spirit, you're going to feel some guilt. And you know they say you shouldn't feel guilt, but I say you ought to feel guilt when you don't obey the Lord because that's what's going to draw you back to Him. So you have a choice. I don't care what Satan tells you, you have a choice now with the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. You have a choice. You are no longer bound. You are no longer in bondage to your old sin nature. And I don't know about you, but boy, that is a freedom I am so blessed with. Because I was bound. I was under bondage. Praise God. So what are some of the old nature habits that we may have to put to death? Well, I think in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19, starting with verse 19, sort of lays it all out very succinctly for us. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, and probably all four of those, by the way, have references to some sexual in, in, impurity. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions. That means division. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries. I think that covers it all. <laughs> and the like. Of which, in case there may be something else, by the way. And the like. <laughs> Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice continually do, is what the Greek verb there means, such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Will not inherit. You can come to church every day, every night. You can holler out your prayers. You can run up and down this aisle and around the whole building. 
but you practice these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this is not a condemnation. What this is, though, is the truth. And the truth is what's going to set you free. The truth is going to set you free. You know, there's a lot in our contemporary society going on about gender identity and all sorts of things. It's really hot in our contemporary world. And by the way, let me put a plug in for hot topics coming up. I think it's Wednesday the 12th. Is it 12th it starts? Wednesday the 12th are hot topics. You know what our first hot topic is going to be? Because if you can't talk about it in the church, where can you talk about it and get the Word of God applied to it? We're going to talk about the gender identity crisis in the world today. That's Wednesday, July 12th at 7 o'clock over in the Life Center. And so for the summer, our Hot Topic series, we're going to be, we're going to be looking at some of these contemporary issues that are continually facing us as Christians. They'll throw in, in our face. You can't even walk down the street. But see, we're going to get the Christian perspective. What does God's Word say about it? And least you think it's going to be a condemnation. No. No. If, we, if you happen to be in such a bondage, which one of us can throw the first stone? But what we can do is give you the truth, because the truth is going to set you free. And I believe we're going to give the truth in love, because God is love. And by the way, if you're not speaking anything about it in love, Maybe you ought to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Maybe you ought to keep your mouth shut if you're not speaking with the motivation of love. Because, see, our, our point, we want to bring salvation. And we want to let the Holy Spirit convict. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Pastor Ron doesn't convict. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts. And trust me, I know the Holy Spirit will convict when you're walking in one of these works of the flesh. There is no way you can be a Christian, have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and you continually practice one of these things without feeling conviction from the Holy Spirit. It's just, uh, it, uh, it won't happen. It can happen because God is after to bring you and me into the full purposes of what he's called us to be. And we will never walk in our full purpose if we practice the works of the flesh. But let me also talk about the fruit of the Spirit for a moment. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. See, that's what we have. 
When we have the Holy Spirit living inside us and we allow God to work in us, the fruit of the Spirit ought to be evident in our life. And as Paul told the Corinthians, you can talk in tongues all you want. <laughs> if you don't have the fruit of the Spirit in your life, what good is it? The fruit of the Spirit. Praise God. So then how do we initiate this process of what us old folks used to call sanctification? in our life, because we do have to play a part. We have got to do our part to put off the old man, the works of the flesh, and to put on the new creation in Christ to allow the fruit of the Spirit to grow in our life. And how, what do we need to do? We need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to be transformed by the spirit of life. Pastor Charles said last Sunday that the spirit of life is a transformer. Not the type you see on the movies, by the way. This is the real transformation. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. See, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, and I'm going to unpack that to say that's simply denying the flesh and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. In verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, and trust me, the world is going to try to get you to be conformed. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, the battle of, for independence from the old sin nature begins in the mind. We've got to renew that mind. We've got to renew our thought processes. Because how we think is how we're going to act. But remember, we have a new king on the throne of our hearts. There's a new shelf in town. And the Holy Spirit living inside of us gives us the power to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, one of my favorite psalms. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scorn scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That is the man or woman whose delight is in the law of the Lord. This cannot be understated. Pastor Charles mentioned it last Sunday. Meditating on the Word of God is a must if we're going to grow and be who's God, who God has called us to be and is so crucial in winning the battles for independence. See, every victory over a sinful habit is a victory that realizes our declaration of independence to be a reality in our life. See, we have this power of the Holy Spirit, and I keep repeating it because it's so important. It is so important we understand, the, that I understand the role of the Holy Spirit. Because it is the same power living in us that resurrected Christ from the dead. 
And that's a lot of power. <laughs> we can deny fleshly desires. God has given us what we need in order to do that. And so if you're like me, you may have experienced some failures as you attempt to deny the old sin nature. But see, I encourage you, don't let Satan discourage you to give up the battle. Because see, the victory is yours because the battle is the Lord's. And you will gain that victory. Do not give up. Keep fighting the battle. Keep fighting that battle. Because you see, sin is a bondage. And it's a chain that holds us back. And I don't care what the bondage is. It could be drug addiction. It could be sexual addiction. It could be anger. It could be hatred. It could be unforgiveness. It could be selfish ambition. There is no sin bondage that cannot be broken by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And if there's someone, either online or in this congregation, sitting, that is battling, let me give you words of encouragement. We all battle. We all battle with that old sin nature. But see, we've got some victories we can look back on and say, Lord, you brought me through that. You gave me that victory, and you're going to give me this victory as well. Keep pushing. Keep walking. Keep following the Holy Spirit. <laughs> With a renewed mind, see, you call on the power of the Holy Spirit. You refuse to obey that sin desire in your mind, tempting you to sin. You offer your body to righteousness you follow the lead of the new king on the throne of your heart. You follow the leading of the Holy Spirit telling you to deny that desire. And you don't act upon that sinful desire. But you act upon offering your body to righteousness. That's the process we're talking about. The question becomes, are you going to do it? Are we going to do it? If you want a new, a fresh anointing of the Spirit in your life, today's the day. Today is the day that we believe God has ordained for that to happen. If you can get on our feet and if the worship team can come back. Today is the day. Today is the day for that fresh anointing, that fresh empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your life. Today is that day. Today is the day. You know, we talk about the altar up here as the altar of exchange. If you want that fresh anointing today, how about stepping up, declaring to the Lord, yes, Lord, I want your fresh anointing on my life today. How about coming up to the altar? Join us here at the altar for that fresh anointing that God has for you in your life today. That fresh anointing, that empowerment to do what God's called you to do. That fresh empowerment, that fresh anointing.
that fresh anointing. Lord, help us. Lord, give us that fresh anointing, I pray, Father. Father, I pray, Lord, through your mighty spirit that you move mightily upon this house today. If you're online, stand up. That'll be your altar. Stand up. Holy Spirit, we pray for that fresh anointing on our lives, Lord. We need you, Father. We need your Holy Spirit, Father, to enliven us, Lord, to empower us, Father, to refresh us mightily, we pray, Father. Your Holy Spirit, move as only you can move, God. That fresh anointing, that fresh empowerment. Fill us, Lord, afresh and anew. We pray in Jesus' mighty name.